Right, so welcome everyone to the Schubert seminar. Uh, today we have another uh, three short talks uh, by um, uh, graduate students this time. And uh, without further ado, we're going to start with uh, Hugh Dunning from uh, The Ohio State University telling us about differential identities for Schubert polynomials via pipe dreams. Please take it away, Hugh. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for attending today. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some uh, combinatorics of pipe dreams, and in particular, how you can use pipe dreams to um, get some differential identities that we have for Schubert polynomials. So our story begins not with uh, derivatives, but rather with it's a tale of two operators. So I have these nabla and delta, um, and these are going to be linear operators acting on this complex vector space with basis indexed by permutations of size n. So permutations in Sn. So how are they defined? Well, a nabla of a permutation is going to be the sum over um, weak order covers going downward. So I'm summing over all SKW covered by W. Um, and then how many copies of SKW am I getting? Well, I'm getting K of them. Um, so delta is going to be a similar story, except instead of going downward in weak order, I'm, I'm summing over all covers in Bruhat order going upward. So I'm summing over all permutations TABW covering W. So TAB is the simple transposition swapping A and B. Um, and then it's a little more complicated what I get. Um, so I get two, one plus two times the size of this, um, this set, which I'm calling CWAB, um, many copies of TABW, where um, CWAB is the set of all C greater than B, such that W inverse C is between W inverse A and W inverse B. So this might seem a little mysterious at the moment, but the reason we're defining things like this is because, uh, well, Christian Gates and Yibo Gao showed that if you take Nobla and Delta together, they form the lowering and raising operators of an SL2 action on this vector space. Um, so the weight spaces of this representation are gonna be the permutations of a fixed length. Uh, and the reason that they were thinking about this is because once you have an SL2 action on a, a post set like this, you automatically get that your post set satisfies the strongly Schwerner property, which is a, a regularity condition, um, which tells you something about how big uh, anti-chains in your post set can be. Um, so Nabla was first introduced by Stanley and conjectured to give an SL2 representation. So they explicitly constructed the corresponding operator delta, which is why it has this weird form or maybe a slightly unusual form. So I'm gonna switch gears now and head over to talking about Schubert polynomials. So to do so, I need to introduce uh, our fundamental combinatorial object, which are gonna be pipe dreams, or maybe I should say reintroduce since Tiani talked about these two weeks ago in his talk. Um, but as a reminder, so a pipe dream for a permutation W is going to be a tiling of this staircase. So I have um, this staircase with these elbow tiles along the diagonal or the anti-diagonal. And then I can fill in each of these gray tiles with either a cross or a bump. So I want to um, have the network of pipes connect the top indices to the corresponding indices on the left. And I also want that no two of the pipes are crossing more than once. So that's going to be this reduced um, adjective I have in front of pipe dream. But in this talk, all pipe dreams are going to be reduced. So as an example, I can take the permutation. Oh, Duke, I'm sorry. There is a question by Alan. Uh, is how unique is delta given the nabla and the weight spaces? Um, I think it's, um, it's going to be uniquely determined. Uh, from the theory of like finite dimensional SL2 representations. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So back to the example. So we have our permutation two, one, four, three. Um, and we have three pipe dreams, three reduced pipe dreams for two, one, four, three, which are these first three I have. Um, and you can check that all of the pipes connect the indices on the top to the corresponding indices on the left. Um, this last pipe dream, uh, it does this, it does the correct thing with the indices, but unfortunately my pipes three and four are crossing, um, more than once. So they're crossing three times here. So I, I want to ban configurations like this. 
OK, so with pipe dreams, I can define now um, not Schubert polynomials, but this notion of padded Schubert polynomial uh, as generating functions over pipe dreams. So my padded Schubert polynomial is going to be in variables x's and z's. And I get a monomial in the x's and z's for each pipe dream where the weight um, is determined as follows. So I get an xi for every cross um, appearing in my pipe dream. And the i corresponds to the row index of the cross. Uh, so every cross is going to correspond an xi, where i is its row index. And I have a similar story for the zi's. So I'm uh, for every bump in my pipe dream, I'm getting a zi, where i is the row index of that bump. So you can think of these as sort of a homogenization of uh, your usual Schubert polynomials, which is a little funny since Schubert polynomials are already homogenous. But I'm homogenizing with respect to each subscript separately. So if you take, if you count the number of xi's and the number of zi's appearing, uh, you, it should remain constant among all monomials appearing here. Um, right. So without the zi's, I just have the usual definition for Schubert polynomials. Um, so you can get that by setting all of the zi variables equal to one. Um, so I think it's worth going through an example. So here's our permutation from before with its three reduced pipe dreams. So to get its padded Schubert polynomial, I'm going to take each pipe dream appearing here um, and then replace every cross with a corresponding x variable with the subscript corresponding to the row it's in. And I'm going to replace every bump with a zi where the i corresponds to the row the bump is in. Um, and then I take the product of all of the weights, and that gives me the weight of the pipe dream. So in this case, I have three monomials corresponding to each of the three um, uh, reduced pipe dreams for 2, 1, 4, 3. OK, so why am I working with padded Schubert polynomials and not Schubert polynomials? Well, it allows me to define uh, these dual operators. So I have this um, nobla tilde, which I'm defining to be a sum over partial x derivatives. So I'm summing over all of the partial partial xi's. Uh, but then I'm reweighting by a zi. So in other words, you can think of this as decreasing the xi weight of a polynomial and then re-adding um, the corresponding z weight. Um, right, so that's my nobla. And my delta is going to be, uh, well, the opposite. So instead of taking partial x's, I'm going to take partial z's. And then I'm going to scale back up by the corresponding xi. Um, and it turns out that if you do this, uh, a very curious thing happens. So Hamaker, Pechenik, Spire, and Weigand showed that if you take a permutation uh, W and apply this nobla to the padded Schubert polynomial for W, you get a sum um, over weak order covers going downwards, and you get k copies of the Schubert polynomial, or the padded Schubert polynomial, corresponding to SKW. So this is precisely the form um, the formula for nobla that we had um, in the abstract setting, where we defined it just as an operator on a vector space with basis indexed by permutations. So you can think of this as a realization of that nobla from earlier. Um, and so here we reap the benefits of working with padded Schubert polynomials, because if you take these two operators together, um, they also satisfy the um, Lee bracket relation that we want for an SL2 uh, representation. So once you know that Nobla has this form on Schubert polynomials, you get that delta acts the same way as our formal delta did earlier for free. So in particular, um, the proofs of these identities were purely algebraic, despite there being um, many, uh, the formulas being purely combinatorial in nature. So I just have some non-negative integers appearing. So this begs the question, um, where is the combinatorial proof? So that'll be the goal of the talk today, is to uh, walk us through some examples of um, how this bijective proof is going to work for each of these identities. Um, so um, I guess I'll check if there are any more questions. We're good. OK, well. So to describe these bijections, I need to talk about some moves you can perform on pipe dreams. So our fundamental move is going to be the crossover 
uh, where I can swap a pipe dream like this for a pipe dream like this. And well, it's a little unclear what's going on, but if you notice, I have a cross here, which I am moving upward to this position up here. So let me highlight the pipes that are going through these crosses. Uh, and you can see that what's really going on is I'm exchanging a cross with a bump, uh, but the pipes that are passing through these tiles are the same. So essentially, um, I'm just moving the crossing point of these two pipes upward. Um, so this, the, the result of this is that the underlying permutation of the pipe dream remains constant, but I can move the crosses around like this. So as a consequence, I get ladder moves, which is a situation where I have a rectangle of um, pluses with a single plus in the bottom left. And then what I can do is I can take that plus and move it up to the top right. And you can see that this is just a special case of a crossover. Um, and then more generally, if I have a column of pluses on the left with a row of uh, bumps at the top and a bump in the bottom right, then I can move the bottom left cross up to the top right and shift over all of the intermediate crosses. Uh, and you can think of this as applying um, or successively replying ladder moves, starting with the first cross here, moving it up to the top right, and then proceeding in sequence. I should check if you can see my cursor. I'm not sure if that's coming up on the feed. It does. Like we can it see. does. OK, that, that's good. This might be very confusing without it. OK, so let's start with the Nobla bijection. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, so whenever I take derivatives, I want to think of that combinatorially as marking a particular atom giving um, component of my objects. So in this case, I'm taking a partial derivatives in the xi's. So I want to think of the left hand side as being a generating function over cross marked pipe dreams, since these are the um, the crosses are what are giving me the x weights. Right, but since I'm also multiplying by a corresponding z weight whenever I reduce the x weight, uh, I want to think of these cross marked pipe dreams as uh, contributing the same weight as the normal pipe dream, except the, modif the marked cross gives a modified weight of a zi rather than an xi. So in other words, whenever I have a cross-marked pipe dream, where P is a pipe dream and IJ is a cross in the pipe dream, I want to think of the cross as giving a Z weight instead of an X weight. And then the left-hand side becomes um, essentially a generating function over these cross-marked pipe dreams. OK, so now if we expand out the identity a little bit, you can see that um, what I want to do is I want to start with a pipe dream Q uh, contributing to the right-hand side of my equation. So Q is going to come from some SKW, which is covered by W. And then I want to produce K cross-marked pipe dreams. So I'm going to label them P1 through PK for W that contribute the same modified weight to the left-hand side. All right, so how is that going to work? Well, I think the best way to see this is through an example. So um, we're going to take the following um, permutation. So W is this big um, long permutation in S12. And we're going to pick K equals 5. So this is our starting pipe dream. So this is our pipe dream Q corresponding to SKW, which lives below W in weak order. Uh, and I'm going to start by looking at columns K and K plus 1. So when I do this, I'm going to have some block of crosses um, up top, so rows with two crosses in them. And then eventually, I hit a row that does not have two crosses in them. So I'll keep going down. And then eventually, I should also hit a row that has two bumps in them. So you can guarantee this is going to happen because my pipe dream is reduced. And I know that pipes k and k plus 1 do not cross since skw is beneath w in weak order. OK. So my next step is to perform a generalized ladder move in this inner rectangle. So I'm shifting over these two crosses. And then the result of this is that pipes k and k plus 1 now bump away in this top left corner. So now I can add a cross here, uh, which has the effect of crossing 5 and 6. And this gives me a pipe dream for w. So this is going to be my p1. 
And to finish, I want to mark this bottom left cross um, to go along with this pipe dream. And so you can check that the result of this is that I have shifted over the cross that was here. It's now over here. And the cross that was here is now over here. And then I had two bumps originally, but now I have a bump and the marked cross. Um, and so by checking all of this, you can see that the weight of this pipe dream uh, remains unchanged. So I had this additional cross here, but because it's marked, it's contributing the weight of a bump. OK, so this is our first uh, cross-marked pipe dream. But now we got to find um, four more, since k is equal to 5 here. So I have to find 5 in total. So I'm going to describe a process that moves this cross, the marked cross, over to the left one column at a time, uh, producing a new cross-marked pipe dream at each stage. So there are two cases for what can happen. The first is if I have a cross directly to the marked cross, uh, directly to the left of the marked cross, in which case I can just slide the mark over one tile to the left. And so this gives us uh, a second cross-marked pipe dream. And since I'm just sliding over the mark in a row, this isn't going to change the weighting of the pipe dream. The second situation occurs when I have a bump to the left of the marked cross. So in this situation, I can find a rectangle where my bottom row is two bumps. And I can guarantee this because my pipe dream is reduced. Uh, and then I can perform a generalized ladder move to slide both of these crosses downward. So the mark starts in the top right and then ends up in the bottom left. And you can check that before and after this move, the weighting of my pipe dream is the same. Since essentially I'm moving a bump from the top right to the bottom left. Um, yeah, so these are the two cases for what can happen. So to finish off, um, we're in a case one. So I'm going to slide the mark over to the left. This gives us our this fourth um, cross-marked pipe dream. Warning. <clears throat> yeah, Sorry thank to you. you, but you're three minutes. Yeah, morning. no problem. And then finally, I have a case two. So I'm going to do a generalized ladder move, which moves the cross down into the first column. So this is our, these are our five cross-marked pipe dreams. So I'm going to quickly try to run through the delta bijection. Uh, and it's very similar in its idea. So I want to think of the left-hand side as counting not cross-marked pipe dreams, but bump-marked pipe dreams where the bump contributes a weight of x rather than a weight of z. Um, so what do, I, what do I want to do here? So starting with a pipe dream on the right-hand side, I want to produce this quantity many bumped mark pipe dreams for w on the left-hand side, uh, which I will label as p0. And then for every c in my set, I'm going to have a p sub c and a p prime sub c. Um, right, so I'm starting with a pipe dream Q for a permutation TABW that covers W. OK, so how's this going to work? Well, we're going to start with our pipe dream Q in TABW. So here, W is this permutation, A is 5, and B is 8. Um, and our first step is to look at pipes A and B. And since I know TABW is above W, these pipes must cross at some cross in the pipe dream. Um, so our first step is to just uncross these pipes. And this will give us our p naught. Uh, so to get the marked bump, I just want to mark the new bump that appears in the pipe dream. And then effectively, I've just turned a cross into a marked bump. So here, I have a pipe dream with the same weighting. So this is our first bump marked pipe dream. And then how should we interpret this set? So um, right, so this is going to be the set of all C greater than B, so that W inverse of C is between W inverse A and W inverse B. Well, this corresponds to all of these yellow pipes that begin to the right of our pipe B and that end up in between pipes A and B on the left-hand side. So I'm going to just do the example for C equals 11. So what are we going to do? Uh, I'm going to describe a process that moves the bump around. Uh, you, until you have it, like a one minute left yeah. before we have to put on the next speaker. So just to let yeah, you know. Yeah, so I, maybe I should wrap things up. Um, essentially, the process is going to move the bump around until it eventually lands up on the um, marked pipe C. 
So I'm going to eventually hit this pipe dream, uh, which is going to be our first pipe dream corresponding to this choice of C. And then I can perform one final crossover to get our second one. And I think I am out of time now. So I think this is a good place to wrap up. Thanks. Thank you very much.